Welcome to Telling the Tooth, the official mental dental podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gross, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Dr. Laura Jaycox. Hello. We have an excellent episode with Dr. Steedle today, and he's truly an expert in the realm of practice management. And I'm so excited for him to share some of his pearls of wisdom with all of the listeners out there. I'll be joining the interview a little bit late um, due to a prior commitment, um, but I'm very excited to talk to Dr. Steedle. He was a critical part of my uh, residency education. Um, the practice management curriculum runs through all three years of the UNC Orthodontic Residency Program and is a critical part of what we learn. Um, you know, practicing dentistry is one piece of the puzzle, but learning how to manage staff, interact with patients and families, and build the positive working culture that we all hope to work in is just as important to our success as the dental school component. And um, I credit him with, you know, a huge amount of the knowledge I wanted to practice with and cannot imagine having gone into practice without um, having the, the core concepts that he taught us and, and my co-residents. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to have him on the program today. I could not agree more with you, Laura. So with that, I hope you all enjoy the interview. Dr. Rick Steedle received his dental degree with honors from the University of Pennsylvania. While in dental school, he also completed a master's degree in education. He then received his master's degree in orthodontics at UNC, where he was awarded the Moorhead Fellowship in Postgraduate Dentistry and an NIH Research Training Fellowship. After orthodontic residency, he and Dr. Bruce McLean built a three-office orthodontic practice with a staff of more than 25 employees near Winston-Salem, North Carolina. In 2005, Dr. Steedle joined the part-time faculty at the Department of Orthodontics. Since then, he's developed a three-year curriculum in practice management for the residents, which includes more than 100 hours of instruction and a 700-page manual. UNC now has one of the most comprehensive practice management residency courses in the country. Dr. Steedle has also published several articles on practice management and has spoken nationally and internationally on the topic of the successful, not stressful practice. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Steedle. It's great to have you. It's my pleasure. As we mentioned in your introduction, your expertise is in practice management, and you've specifically spoken on the successful, not stressful practice. And... The premise there is, you know, it's easy to have like a low success, low stress practice or a high success, high stress practice, but it's much more challenging to develop a high success, low stress practice. So first, could you give our audience a little backstory about maybe your Winston-Salem practice, the Reedsville practice, and some of the lessons that you learned uh, through that journey? Well, I was very fortunate that uh, when I first uh, left residency, I actually went and taught at, at medical school. There was a department of dentistry there. I did that for about four years. It then became dissatisfied with that. And then we set up a, a practice from scratch in Winston-Salem with actually a, a fellow uh, resident classmate of mine. Uh, so we started that from scratch um, and began to build that. Um, it, it went fairly well, but then we kind of went into a crisis at about our eighth and ninth year where he and I weren't getting along, staff weren't getting along. Um, We were actually thinking about dividing up the practice. Um, But fortunately, I was with someone who was a quality person and we decided to resolve our differences and work on. But the material that that I talk about in practice management really comes from that crisis because, you know, I think all of us leave the residency with a fairly good knowledge of clinical orthodontics, but don't have much background in running an orthodontic practice. Um, and so we set out during that, after that crisis and, the, and our commit, recommitment to each other to try to really change the way we did things. And we, you know, we searched, I mean, I personally searched conventions and things, but most of what I was getting from them at the conventions was this, I, you know, the, here's a neat little trick you can do that with your staff to 
you know, get them motivated and just little tricks. And I was looking more for, you know, the real fundamentals on how to run a practice. And when I began to realize I was looking for leadership information. So I turned to um, the business literature and search, yeah, we spent a couple of years searching the business literature to try to resolve all the problems we had. So most of what I teach comes from business literature on team building, on leadership, on uh, personal development and, and team development and practice operations. And so when we did that, things then took off again. I mean, we, the crisis resolved, we were able to really grow quite dramatically after we resolved some of those major issues. And, you know, we had quite a large practice and two of us had three offices and more than 25 employees. Uh, we sold that practice, came to UNC, actually actually developed a three-year curriculum there of, of kind of the, what we had learned during our journey. And then took over another practice in Reedsville, the one you you mentioned, uh, which had, which was basically hadn't changed since the 1970s and renovated that, brought that up, grew that practice, and um, then eventually doubled that practice in three and a half years. So it, it was, the, the residents at the time used to joke that was, that was our, my lab for the practice management course, you know, that, that if I could apply it to this really archaic practice that the, the you know, the, and, and modernize it, that, you know, that it was a reinforcement, the principles that I've been teaching worked. So that's kind of a, a, a backstory. Yeah. Uh, one of your big mantras that um, you talk about in that practice management course that we have is, you know, thinking about creating systems rather than thinking about solving problems. Um, could you mm -hmm. talk to our audience a little bit about management by design, like designing systems versus just crisis management, trying to put out fires? Right. What we didn't realize before our crisis and did realize after is that problems are byproducts of the system and its execution, mm -hmm. which means that what most of what goes wrong is really a systems problem, not a people problem. It's really easy to blame the people because they're the most visible people who the visible thing that make, you know, we can identify has made the mistake. But if we haven't done our job of creating a really good system, given them good training, been very clear in our directions, and then there's no way even good people can do well. So it was really important that, that one of the things that we really kind of understood is that instead of crisis management, which is really trying to just simply solve problems, uh, we really need to be managed by, by systems, um, management by design. There's a design for everything. You know, there's a design for how the new patient is greeted. There's a design for how each appointment goes. There's a design for, for everything, inventory. And so if you can create these systems and, or design these systems, then you, there's a better chance that they'll be executed well because everyone is clear on what needs to be done. That's like the example you've given, you know. Yeah, let, let's talk about that because I tried to think of an example of, to bring this home. And, and I thought the best example of that was Walt Disney and Disneyland and Disney World. You know, when Walt Disney set out to develop his amusement park, he didn't look at all the problems of amusement parks and simply say, you know, if I can solve all the problems of amusement parks, I'm going to have a great amusement park. He did something quite fundamentally different. He said, he asked the question, not what are all the problems? He asked the question, what do I want to create? Which is management by design. And so he said, this is what I want to, this is the future I see of, of this amusement park that will be so, one, you know, so compelling that people from around the world will come. And, and so he, he wasn't solving problems. He was designing a future. And that's, that's what we need to do in practice. We don't need to just crisis management, crisis manage everything that comes up. We, it's better to say, you know, what do we want our practice to look like three to five years from now? And then re, you know, engineer that change. Uh, and that, and that informs what we need to do today to get there. That's like the Dr. Seidel, we're out of brackets versus design a system <laughs> right. where you never run out of brackets in the first place. You're never out of brackets. And wait, 
even even a better system is you don't run out of brackets and you have very low inventory. Oh, there you go. See, that, <laughs> there's there's the vision. <laughs> in, an, in an ideal world. Just, right, but in an ideal world, because uh, you know, if if you just ha- design a system that doesn't run out of brackets, you really you just solved the problem. Hmm. But if you can design a system that doesn't run out of brackets and keeps a you know very low inventory and just in time delivery of that inventory then you're going to keep you know you have a better system that's the the walt disney vision right there yes <laughs> yes i wonder i wonder if we could talk about maybe a specific example since most of our most of our listeners are dental students or soon to become dentists or already practicing mm-hmm. dentists i wonder if we can think of an example together in the general dental space about some problem that's faced you know all the time and um maybe how we would think through that in an ideal world what we could come up with well i I, you know i think you could look at something either in the in the practice operations side or you can look at on the the people people side you know the staff um, issues side Mm -hmm. which one do you think would be best I mean, inventory is, inventory is a pretty universal thing, but yeah. um, what, what, are, what else other ideas are you thinking? Maybe a staff, a staff issue, say um, two staff members aren't getting along with getting each along. other. Getting mm-hmm. along. Yeah, that's, that never happens. Right? Ne- I've never heard of that happening before. <laughs> <laughs> never heard of that happening. Just came up with it um, on top of my head. There really are only five basic problems with staff. And if you can identify the, the type of problem it is and know where you are in the, in the hierarchy of problems, then you can begin to resolve them. I think people try to resolve the problem as an individual problem. Mm-hmm. And rather than saying, okay, is this a problem of communication? Is this a problem of accountability? Is this a problem of you know, cooperation? And if you understand that, the guidelines from business literature are very clear on what you need to do. And it's also true. And it's, it comes from the five dysfunctions of the team from uh, Patrick Lencioni. You know, you cannot be doing higher level team development until you've laid the foundation for it. And, you know, the foundation obviously is, is getting people to cooperate and then getting people to communicate well, make it, you know, getting people to be accountable and then and then you can get the good results. And I think what most dentists do, orthodontists too, is try to get great results without laying the foundation of a great team synergy. And so um, I think it's understanding how you build a team synergy and team dynamics to the point where you can actually get the results you want. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's hard to solve an individual problem until you've identified the problem of the group. And, mm-hmm. and it's, it's really, you know, it's, it would be like trying to solve a marriage problem by just looking at you're not getting along with your spouse or that sort of thing. It's, it, there's a more fundamental issue that has to be resolved for a team to develop well. Mm-hmm. Does, that, does that make sense? Right. Right. Yeah. I, I think I think it I think all problems with staff need to be viewed at a higher level than in the trenches with them. That'd be my my first approach to something like that. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those staff you know, issues and uh, getting a picture of that team synergy. Uh, you talk a lot about the performance review um, mm-hmm. and that's definitely something. Well, I don't know how anyone. I mean, you can get lucky, <laughs> but I don't know how anyone um, can develop a team without some form, form of, I mean, traditionally it's called a performance review. I, I like to think of it as more of a coaching, okay? a periodic mm-hmm. coaching. You know, if you see yourself not as a judger of your staff, but you see yourself more as their coach and that, that your practice is more of a school in which everyone's learning including the teacher on how to do things better. Um, then you 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 end up with a better, you, more of a chance to have a, a real team synergy and, and really have a great team. Mm-hmm. And so we found in our practice that um, about three times a year, um, every, every four months we had this um, 
coaching session in which they got to evaluate themselves and the team got to evaluate each other. And, and that way we could work on the two things, which is job performance and, and team synergy. And we developed whole, all different kinds of uh, value, uh, forms to make that happen. And the one thing that scares most dentists off is they think it's going to take a lot of time. And we tried every single thing. We finally came up with a way to do this effectively where each, each staff member, member got three um, goals to try to accomplish in the next four months. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were there to support them in those goals and, and it it made tremendous improvements in the practice because everyone was working on something very tangible. Mm -hmm. Right. And you, and you usually follow the, the smarter goals principle, right? There's a certain acronym there. Yeah. Right. Specific measurable aligned there's many different ways to break down the smart s-m-a-r-t right um the ones i like the best are specific you have to be specific about what they're trying to achieve it has to be measurable because you need to know whether it was accomplished or not it needs to be aligned to the practice you know you just can't have a goal that is not aligned with what the entire practice is trying to accomplish Mm -hmm. um it has to be results-based the r the R is an interesting one. We often set goals for people that they don't have control of the results. Hmm. And so if you say to the front desk, you know, um, I want you to schedule every new patient exam that's on the book you know, that we have, ske- you know, templated for. Well, they don't have control of that, you know, so that's not a results based goal. Mm-hmm. But if you could say to them, I want you to offer the next two available ones that's something they can control. So all those goals have to be something they have the total control over. Uh, and then t- the T part is obviously the um, time dependent. You know, there's a certain time frame. The, the smarter goals are, the E is for energizing. I mean, you, you want it to be something that kind of jazzes you up a bit. You don't want this to be a drudgery. And then the R is they have to be recorded. You have to write them down. I mean, you can't expect someone to remember four months later what their target was and what they were expected to do. Mm -hmm. So that's the smarter version of the SMART goals. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's really, really great to have some achievable goal. But And then writing it down is definitely a big one because if I don't write down something, it's it's not usually happening. (laughs) I'll forget right. about it. And the power, the power of those coaching sessions, let's say you have eight employees. Well, you just came up with, I'm doing the math quickly, 24, is that correct? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 24 specific things that your practice is going to accomplish, your team is going to accomplish over the next four months. Well, that's 73, is that right? Yeah, 73 in a year. Well, that, I mean, 73 specific improvements to the pe- the people's either per- job performance or or synergy with the team that um, can make dramatic improvement year over year mm-hmm. right and then you're periodically coaching those people and you're accomplishing those goals and adding new goals and just right every they, they come group. back they say okay we got these three let's let's get three new and and you wonder I mean th- this is not just people who need help. I mean, these can be people who are already excelling and you're going to be giving them more and more responsibility or giving them more leadership roles in the practice. You can take your great employees and make them leaders themselves Mm and a a form of middle management. And that that may be their goals and as opposed to, you know, want you to get faster at at the chair or whatever is somebody who's new into the practice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you've talked about, you know, your five steps a practice owner can take to you know, make this transition of creating systems that mm-hmm. create a high success, low stress environment. And I was thinking we could go through those one at a time to sure. get sort of a blueprint for our listeners. Well, right. one of the things, yes, let me, um, what I talked about at that meeting um, that you're referring to was I mean, we all hear from Michael Gerber, we should work on our practice, not just in it. But there's no any sense of, well, how do you work on your practice and not in it? Mm -hmm. 
And so what I presented there were the five steps to how to work on your practice. Um, and my, what we've been able to do in the two practices I, or three practices I was involved with and others that I've uh, helped uh, in practice are to say, we can't do five things at once. We have to do maybe one or two things at once. And so we have to be identify what I call their t- their top priority, which I call the next greatest challenge. And the next greatest challenge really is if everything else remains the same, what one thing, uh, if we can accomplish, will move the practice forward the fastest. And so the five steps of continuous improvement are identifying that top priority. And then there are steps to analyze that issue in a way that doesn't see it as an individual problem, but as a, a problem that is part of a larger issue. If we can analyze all the contributing factors, then we can begin to plan a comprehensive solution, which is step three, plan the solution. So step one, identify the top priority. Step two, analyze the issue. And step three would be not a quick fix. The solution is a comprehensive uh, system development that will not only resolve the one issue that we might be troubling us, but all the related issues. The step four then would have to begin to implement that plan, you know, which is all the training and all the execution of that plan and beginning to look at, does, is this plan working? Is it giving us the results we want? which comes to step five, which is you have to revise the plan. All plans need to be revised uh, because all plans for, say, uh, you know, the inventory we talked about or a plan to how we're going to handle the new patient all the way from when they call the office until when they actually start treatment. All those plans, um, we, we don't know something. And we have to put that plan into the world and have that the world tell us, Here's where you forgot something, and then we can revise that plan. And once we've tweaked that plan and tweaked that plan, then we can finally adopt it as the new standard for the practice. And the the important point of this is that it's a written plan, meaning that anyone in the practice can say, you know, how do we handle inventory here? And they can go in the, the, the manual and say, here is our written system for handling inventory. Here's our written system for how we handle a new patient by the time they call until they get started or any other system that you might have in the practice. So not only does it become a way to have a reference to what, how we do things in this, in this office, but it, but it it becomes a record of that, but it also becomes a training manual for all new hires. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if, you know, all of a sudden your financial coordinator has, is going to move to Minnesota. Oh, quickly. We need to hire someone, have her train them. No, all the, all the financial systems are in a book of how you do everything. And that becomes the training manual for, for whoever becomes the next financial coordinator. Right. So there, there, there are two books. There's the clinical manual and there's the administrative manual. So each time one of these systems are developed, it's put in the manual and then you go to the next greatest challenge and begin to solve not problems, but issues. And, and to the point where things then become very, things work and they work st- with low stress. Mm-hmm. Right. And to your point, no system is perfect. And you say, you know, right. you try to create a system that results in fewer problems of lesser impact. Right. Really yes. no problem. So yeah, yeah, there, there are no perfect systems. So it, all you want is fewer problems of lesser impact. And, mm-hmm. and, and it just tells you just continue to, no system is set in stone. It just has to continually be tweaked because the world is ever changing. So our systems have to continue to be refined as things change. I mean, COVID came, right. uh, even historically women working changed the way we have to handle things. So mm-hmm. the world is constantly changing. We just have to keep adapting to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's work through, can we talk about, say one big problem that I know as you know, in the orthodontic space, we deal with broken appointments all the time. General yes. dentists, I'm sure are dealing with broken appointments. Let's say that, you know, we have meet with our team, list out the key frustrations. And that's one of the big ones is that patients are constantly no showing. 
Um, mm-hmm. you know, how would we kind of run through that five-step process to maybe think about dealing with improving our systems to deal with broken appointments? Let's say, that, let's say we've identified that is really our production is being hurt in a general dental office because people are breaking appointments. Right. I'm going to introduce a concept that I don't think a lot of dentists think about is that we have to train our patients. In mm-hmm. other words, if there's no consequence for a broken appointment, then if something better comes up, they're going to break the appointment. Mm. Yeah. So I think what we have to do first is ask the three questions that we talk about in the, um, in the meeting was the first question is what are all the problems? So we would sit down with our staff and say, you know, what are all the situations in which people break appointments? Because what, what are all the problems related to that? And then the second question we ask in that, so they may be, for example, pa- patient can't get off work or, patient doesn't call and and tell us or patient calls in the morning and and tells us they won't be there at nine o'clock when it's already 8 30 you know there you can just list problem after problem after problem the next step in creating the vision of what we want is to say so what do we want instead well we want them if they know there's a change in their plans to call us as soon as possible okay now at this stage we don't know yet whether they how to how to fix it. And I think what tends to happen when we go into these meetings with staff is we start thinking of solutions too early. Because if we start thinking of solutions at that stage, all we're doing is still fixing problems. So the first question, what are all the problems? You brainstorm all the problems, all the situations in which patients break appointments, all the excuses they've given us, everything. Then you say, what do we want instead? Which you say, um, you know, we want them to call us as soon as they know. We want them to give us at least this much notice, whatever those come up with. But there's a third question that very few practices ask. And that is, the third question is, in an ideal world, what would we want? Okay, so in an ideal world, what we want asks a fundamentally different question because it's not problem solving, it's visioning. And so, for example, in an ideal world, we want to be able to fill that appointment, even though they broke it. Well, again, we don't know how yet, but that's one of our visions. In an ideal world, we want um, to be able to extend an, er- an earlier appointment into that appointment so that we continue to be productive. So these are the questions where we brainstorm ideas that are not answering problems there or being the reverse of the problem. It's simply you know, it's the, what I call the Disney question, you know, in an ideal world, what would we want? It's only then do we begin to think about solutions because now what we have is our vision, our vision of what, what we're going for. And it's not limited by simply problems. It's, or it's not limited by our experience. It's limited by our, it's not, it's now being used our, in our imagination of what's possible. And that's how you would work through that. And obviously that's not one meeting, that's a series of meetings in which you go through this process to come up with that vision. Then you begin the process of planning solutions. Yeah. Now, you wanna talk about solutions? Yeah. The best best solution (laughs) is what? The case principle, right? Yep, copy and steal everything. Meaning that there's no reason if we have a problem in our practice, dental practice, orthodontic practice, pediatric dental practice, someone somewhere has solved that problem. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to go find that solution, bring it back to the practice, and then tweak it because every situation is different and adopt it. Because the fastest way to get solutions is not rack your brains and trying to figure it out. I mean, there are what hundred thousand dentists and, and and there's a long history of dentistry. Somebody's been able to solve this broken appointment problem and we just need to go and find it. This is the where I think the role of consultants is the best. I don't think consultants, I personally don't like consultants. I wouldn't have a consultant come into my practice and take over my practice, but I would have find a consultant who's really good at something, whether it's broken appointments or scheduling or whatever, and bring them into practice to help me 
uh, resolve an issue that I'm having. Mm-hmm. And, and essentially what I'm doing is copy and stealing that person's system. You know, so that's, and then not, I'm going to, you know, our, our practice is going to tweak it because every situation is a little different. Exactly. Someone, but, someone has dealt with this problem before and yeah, yeah. no, no point reinventing the wheel and wasting time on that, all of that groundwork. Right. Then the next step of that, let's just take this broken point. We've, we've, we've come up with a solution that seems to work. We need to do some training and we need to do so that everyone understands their role in that system, you know? And so it, it's gotta be written down. Everyone who is going to implement that system has to understand it. Anytime you train, you're gonna to have to retrain. None of us do it right the first time. Sometimes the second and third time we don't do it right. Mm-hmm. And we as the leader of that practice have to understand that our staff is not gonna do it perfectly for a while that there is a learning curve on any new system implementation that has to, has to be, and we have to support them. And when something goes wrong or something, someone's not following the system, we don't say, we don't get upset with them. We just say, hey, let's go look at the system and see which step was missing and that they got this different result. And then, and then tweak that system and, and refine that system until finally it says, you know, I think this is covering most of the issue of broken appointments as best we can, can. And that becomes the standard operating procedure for our practice. Yeah. Does that yeah, answer absolutely. for you, Ryan? Absolutely. Thank you. I was going to say one thing I've always liked that you said with regards to those staff meetings is that, you know, people with no voice won't buy into the system. Right. Um, and so maybe- people must, yeah, people must weigh in to buy in. And that is that if you are told, I mean, it's just human nature. If, if someone comes to you and say, says, okay, this is how we're going to do it. And you don't have buy-in with that. But if you sat down with that person, even in your personal life, and you've worked out a, a solution together, it becomes not their system, but our system. And so anyone who tries you know, and the classic example of this is someone, come, you know, Dennis comes back from a continuing ed course and just says, okay, this is what we're going to do. And, and <laughs> the staff thinks, you know, give, give him about three or four weeks, he or she will settle back down again. <laughs> but it, it's not their system uh, or it's not their, you know, it's not theirs. But if, if we can give our staff voice in the decision making and voice in the um, formulation of whatever solution we're coming up with, then it becomes their system. But it has additional power is that it be, people begin to understand how what they do either helps or hurts the person down line from them. So for example, if the treatment coordinator who saw the new patient doesn't record how the payment arrangements were, the financial coordinator is going to have to scramble when that patient comes in to have treatment. But if there's a coordination of effort because the treatment coordinator now knows that if she doesn't, he or she doesn't get it to the financial coordinator in time, that's gonna adversely impact the financial coordinator, then there's more likely that they'll, they'll go ahead and get that information to them. So people are in their own silos sometimes and don't see the impact of their behavior on the others. But when you sit down together and formulate a system together, you see, the impact of everything you do, how it impacts the next person in line of that system, but also why you need something from the person earlier up upstream from that system to make sure you can do your job the best. Mm -hmm. And that's what you really formulate those staff meetings, those brainstorming sessions. You can just kind of say whatever crazy idea you want and there's no judgment in terms of the yeah problem. that's that's the yeah. yeah that's the principle of brainstorming the idea of brainstorming if you look it up is that there's no judgment so for example when we were coming up with our uh, collection system someone suggested a you know a bank deposit box where they could put in their payments you know well everybody laughed but it, usually those crazy ideas have a have an idea within them sometimes and so that's the idea, the power of brainstorming is that people play off each other with good ideas, mediocre ideas, crazy ideas, and it spurs more thought 
especially when you're trying to come up with those in an ideal world type situations. Mm -hmm. Hey, Laura. The, hello. Uh, the, the staff have a unique perspective because they're the ones directly in, interacting with the situations that oh, they're managing. Gosh, yes. And so their mm -hmm. feedback is so critical in terms of how to implement a system in, in that particular practice with that particular patient base. And having their input is, is critical both for it succeeding and also for their buy-in. It, I can, I can honest, when I'm talking to my front desk or, or the people who are in the administration, I can honestly say to them, I don't know what goes on up there. You guys, you know, in the trenches, you're the ones that have to inform me because I'm only guessing of how it goes. You guys know how it goes. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, you really have to trust your staff to, to be able to give you that information. Otherwise you're working with partial information. Yes. And you're not going to get as good a solution. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is there anything else, Dr. Seidel, you think we, that I missed? I know we talked about. I think the biggest point that is missed is that none of this stuff happens unless we get become better leaders. I mean, unless we develop our skills of working with people, working with relationships, building a relationship with the staff. And I don't mean just being friendly with them. I, I'm talking about building a very tight, meaningful working relationship in which not only do you enjoy being with these people, but you are, enjoy accomplishing things together. And that, that it all starts with us to be able to develop those leadership skills. And gosh, there's a, hundreds of books on leadership that, that if, if we don't, if our, practice isn't working well and our team isn't working well the first step isn't to look to them the first step is look to ourselves and to begin to see what do we need to be doing differently um, you know it's not what it, it's it's not what we do a lot of times it's who we are that makes the difference in that in that team development and you know improving practice operations and I think that's the, that's the point where you know, all of us have studied dentistry thoroughly and go to continuing education courses to get better at being dentists and orthodontists and specialists. But, you know, how much time do we spend learning to be better leaders? And that's if, if there are problems in the practice, that's where you start is to start reading and the wealth of information that's out there about how to how to be a better leader. Are there any books or resources in particular that you'd recommend people to check out for? Oh, gosh, yes. I'd, I'd listen to everything by Simon Sinek on the YouTube. Um, anything by Patrick Lencioni uh, in terms of team development. Um, I, I'd, I'd be looking at the Michael Gerber stuff on systems. Um, there's, there's a whole group, and I could probably put together a little list of, um, you know, oh, oh, um, Stephen Covey's book was the one that really just put the light bulb in my head when I read it, you know, and that, that's, 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 that would be a good place to start. I, you've also put together a huge number of resources that are available um, online. Where would, which of your resources would you recommend and how can our listeners access them? Well, I mean, I have a website, which is not, not surprisingly, successnotstress.org. Uh, one word, obviously, successnotstress.org. And what I've tried to put there, and, I, and I'm, still, I'm still developing it, is there are 15 ideas that every leader should have in order to run a practice. And, if, and that's a very foundational understanding of, of the three areas that I think are important, which is personal leadership, practice operations, and team uh, d dynamics and synergy. And these are the probably the best resources. I mean, they're gleaned from, I copied and stole everything and just translated into dentistry. But it, it, it was kind of the best ideas that I thought that were essential to know to, in order to run a successful and, and not stressful practice. So that, that's, a, that's a good resource. I've written several articles that you can access there as well. And there's some videos. My ambition for the new year is to do more video on that, but uh, we'll see how that develops. 
Awesome. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I found your website and resources really helpful and I think our our listeners will as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Definitely. And we can include a link to all of that in the description of the video so people can check out your website and the books and everything that you recommended for sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you. That's what it's there for. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Seidel. It's been great talking to you. And um, I know all, all our listeners will get a lot from this. And, and if they want more, they, they know where to go. So thanks again for being with us. It was really fun talking to you. Well, thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. See you, Ryan. Bye-bye, Lark. All right. So that was a great, great talk with Dr. Seidel. I know a lot of the stuff we've heard before, Laura, but just hearing it again in a new light. And um, it's it's just always good to talk to Dr. Seidel. He's so knowledgeable on this topic and just presents it in such a digestible way that I really appreciate. I do too. I mean, his, his main axioms of practice management are always playing in the back of my head and have really guided um, the way I interact with with our staff and the systems that I've put in place since joining the practice um, and, and the way that we approach, um, you know, updates and changes in our practice. I also really value his viewpoint of, you know, copy and steal everything where, mm-hmm. you know, we're kind of taught throughout school to, you know, never copy people's work, which, which is true when it comes to school. But when it comes to running a practice, it's always best to take tried and true concepts and apply it in your own business um, in a way that can help make things better for both your patients and your staff and yourself. Exactly. And we didn't get a chance to talk about this during the interview, but he's talked to us about lead goals and lag goals. And I know a lot of the temptation out there is to just focus on the end goal or the lag goal, which is, you know, I want to hit a million dollars of production this year, or, you know, I want to lose 20 pounds this year, or whatever the goal may be, but instead turning your focus to how you get there, the means to the ends, like the type of staff training that's involved to get to that production, the type of the meetings that are required to get everyone on the same page, to breed this culture, to develop these systems, the, the diet and the exercise to get to those 20 pounds lost. Like those are the things that we have to focus on, not just the end goals, not being narrow sighted, but really focusing on how we're going to get there and the work that's going to be required to get there. Absolutely. I remember him drawing on the board a picture of multiple little hills and you would go from mountain peak to mountain peak as you build towards the ultimate goal. And it makes it much more attainable. If you say, okay, I'm going to make a million dollars in revenue this year, and you're at a hundred thousand, that's a, that's a huge Delta. And that's something that seems feasible to anybody, but when you're able to break it down into incremental steps of working towards the larger goal, it becomes much more attainable for you and much more within reach for your staff to get behind the mission and get behind each of those individual steps to take you from the beginning to the end. Exactly. Exactly. The peak, like you said, peak to peak mindset. I, I hope you guys do take some time to um, go to his website, um, Successful Not Stressful Practice. Um, I've found a lot of great resources there, um, and it's it's a great thing for especially orthodontists, but also general dentists, anybody in the dental community um, for uh, resources and how to revamp your systems, how to approach staff management, and how to move towards a more effective and less stressful way of practicing. Yep, absolutely. And again, we'll include links to that in the description so you can get to those easily. And if you have any follow-up questions after this episode for us or Dr. Seidel, feel free to leave them in a comment below this video. You can send us an email at officialmentaldental at gmail.com and we'll address those questions to you directly or in a future episode. That's it for this one, guys. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you all in the next episode of Telling the Tooth. 